Welcome to. I think my mic is working, yes. Welcome to the Building Center. My name is Colin Tweedy, and I'm Chief Executive of the Building Center and the Built Environment Trust. And I'm thrilled you're all here on a damp Friday evening. Um, we are more and more having events on a Friday evening, and we're delighted to see that they're becoming more and more popular. The Building Centre, um, for those of you who don't know who we were or are, was founded in 1931 as a centre for architecture, engineering, construction, and the built environment to bring together the very best brains and ideas materials, both physical and mental, to bring the construction industry to a wider community. We moved here in 1951 when our um, an original buildings in Bond Street were destroyed in the Second World War. We are thrilled to have such a distinguished um, speaker, actually speaker and interviewer this evening. And um, we're delighted that Patrick Schumacher has um, agreed rather late notice to um, interview um, Renier de Graaf. Um, it was originally, uh, as I think from the original inv invitation, Paul Finch, who it is said he is stuck in China. Now, I'm not sure what stuck in China means. Um, hopefully not under house arrest or anything like that. Um, I don't think you need a visa to leave, but I, I wish um, um, Paul well and I hope he returns soon. But we're delighted that though he's stuck in China, Patrick is here. Patrick Schumacher, I think, knows n needs no introduction from me, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, Patrick is a director of Zaha Hadid Architects and has been at the practice since 1988. He completed projects including the Maxi Centre for Contemporary Art and Architecture in Rome, which won the Sterling and, and won the Sterling Prize in 2010. While practicing as a senior designer, Patrick is an, also known as an educator, public speaker, champion of parametricism, and is himself widely published and is, of course, as I'm sure you all know, remarkably controversial. But I'm sure tonight he is here to elucidate and bring forth the, the brilliance of our um, writer, of course, Rani de Graaf, who is, of course, a partner of OMA, which he joined in 1996. He is now responsible for building and master planning in Europe, Russia, and the Middle East, and has overseen major projects such as Ro Rotterdam's Timberhoof City Hall building and the Holland Green in London. In 2002, he became director of AMO, the think tank of OMA, and among other exhibitions has produced the Image of Europe, an exhibition illustrating the history of the European Union. He's also central to AMO's increasing involvement in sustainability and engine energy planning. To add to his accomplishments, Rainier is now an author. Four Walls and a Roof, The Complex Nature of a Simple Profession is a book which draws on his own tragic comic experiences to present a candid account of what is it is really like to work as an architect. And as I know, there are many architects in this room. You're all waiting to hear what he's going to say. But before I hand over um, to Patrick and to Rainier, I just want to thank the Harvard University Press for the publication and to the o OMA team. Also, just to warn you, or to advise you, that um, tonight is being videoed. So if you're going to be controversial in your questioning, you'll be incorporated for eternity. Um, and just the health and safety issues, as um, I, as the chief executive of this institution, should realize that I should always mention it. If you hear a continuous alarm bell, leave <laughs> by the doors you have entered. There are three of them. And follow the nearest fire exit route as instructed from the fire marshals and the conference team, which hopefully will include me and hopefully I would not panic. But, and do not run, do not use the lifts, and do not return for your Brompton bike. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we will not have any disturbance, and I now hand over to Patrick and Rani. So 
welcome everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Renier called me two days ago, and I'm very grateful that um, Paul Finch is stuck in China. Because <laughs> uh, I looked at a book earlier, and it's a really great book, a great read. So first of all, congratulations. It's a really cool effort, um, and highly thought-provoking, stimulating, and as you admit yourself, highly incoherent. And you, you attribute this, and I made some notes, by the way, because uh, to walk us through some of the issues and challenges I want to place. And maybe we'll, let's see how long it takes, but we definitely want to have an audience engagement that we agreed on earlier, uh, at the latter part of this. So, so uh, you first of all admit that you are a lousy theorist, uh, but you say it's all architects. Not all, I think. <laughs> And uh, you talk about the, the profound co incoherence of the book and that you attribute this to um, the world as being an incoherent um, series of encounters you delivered to you. And I think it's, it reminded me of Rem's co co saying that a career becomes very, just kind of string of random commissions and how one can make some kind of synthesis out of this. Uh, so I think the writings are occasioned by events, by encounters, by projects. But I think you always find a way of uh, triggering wider reflections. And I find it really a lot of deep and challenging questions you're positing. Uh, not so many answers, by the way. And uh, your own account of the book in the preface uh, is that you're calling it the kind of debunking of a series of myths, seven myths. And that's the, the structure you give to the book. And as Richard earlier said, this is in fact, what uh, was a hard thing to, 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 but it became an armature to structures. And these myths are authority, the myth of insp individual inspiration, the myth of good causes in architecture, the myth of control, independence, of large scale mastery, and the myth of progress. And um, I call this kind of approach the critique of ideology. and. I have looked at this book earlier because you've asked me to review it somehow and there's this kind of blurb put on the back cover of it. Uh, but the bit about the concept of ide critical ideology was kind of cut out. So I don't want to confront you with what I was actually wanting to put on the back cover there. Uh, that this is a book offers a critique of ideology without any ideological foundation. And I'm leading to the, to the first challenge. But before I want to say that I discovered that on the back of the book, I'm also kind of paired up with uh, one of my pet ideological hate. I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. It was, large, it was largely about <laughs> you, but the <laughs> publisher was so wise to have that omitted. <laughs> well, she's a viciously good person. And as you know, good people usually hate me. Uh, and we are, we are pet hates. But let me come to my first question. Uh, so in terms of the question of ideology, do you have one? Uh, that is a rather uh, short question with a long introduction. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know, but let me, let me sort of harp back to your introduction because that'll give me time to think <laughs> about an answer to this, uh, uh, yeah, putting me on the spot uh, question. So. I asked you this before, as you remember. I, I know, but I still, that's, I mean, my, my brain works extremely slow. Um, well, the, the debunking of the myth of good causes, I thought yeah. you would appreciate. Uh, um, very much, very much. Um, I, I say most uh, architects are lousy theories. There are, of course, <laughs> exceptions, uh, at least for the duration of the coming hour. Um, I think that uh, being propositional is not necessarily proof of having an, ideo an ideology. I think many people have an ideology without ever putting it into words. Uh, the fact that they don't put it into words doesn't mean they don't have one. I think uh, 
in philosophy, although I would at no instance at all ever uh, call myself such, in philosophy there is a great tradition actually of uh, ideologies founded on the destruction of other people's uh, ideologies. I mean, a, a late 19th century philosopher is an extremely good example um, of that. I mean, my most honest answer um, to that question, which is also why I wrote precisely this type of book, I mean, a book that deliberately skirts telling people what to do. First of all, because I think in this day and age it's impossible. Uh, and second of all, I think by foregoing that, it just gets you closer uh, to the way you feel about things, which I think inherently has an ideology in it. So in as much as there is an ideology, it's by implication. And I mean, you know, Susan Zontag uh, wrote a wonderful book, uh, which is called Against Interpretation, which he, uh, in a way, saw as the essence um, of any work of art, uh, of any piece of writing, and I, I somehow would strongly endorse that. I think this is mostly a piece of writing more than any architectural propositional course uh, of action. I mean, there's a very interesting, you refer to, uh, to what Rem said about a career being, uh, you know, a, a, a chain reaction of essentially random events. I mean, I remember another uh, very beautiful quote. He said, you can have your future decide your dilemmas, and you can have your dilemmas decide uh, your future. So it's, it's, that's the space within uh, which the book operates. And, and whether or not I have an ideology, I would like to leave that um, to the readers who may or may not you know, come to the same conclusion. I will have an answer to that later. I'm the one who's always making the implicit explicit. <laughs> um, let me move on then. The first essay is titled, I Will Learn You, Architecture. It's a kind of saying of Hermann Herzberger trying to speak English at the Berlag, <laughs> and, and, and oh. as far as I understand, and you were a student there. Oh. And in this essay, you talk about the schism between our and at the Berlaget and elsewhere, high-flying, philosophical, what you call a near-megalomanial ambitions about architecture, as taught by hero professors like Herzberger, and the utter mundane <coughs> triviality of work, commercial work. And you're talking about your experience and uh, it's your first job in London. And um, in that same article, though, you also you did debunking, in a way, the idea of the charismatic architect hero, but you seem to also admire it at the same time. So I think there's a lot of ambiguity. So my question is, are you charismatic? No, clearly <laughs> not. Uh, but it's, I mean, you can debunk what you admire. I mean, that is a, that, that is a wonderful state of mind. You know, I do it every day. Um, that, that article is, is, is about, I mean, and, and uh, it again harms back to what you say about the implicit and the explicit. I'm not fully on the side of the implicit. I mean, I, I do not like, you know, mystery to, sh to, to, to cloud nothingness, and I also hope that mm -hmm. that's not what I do, but it's again ultimately for people to, to judge. That article sets up the whole premise of the book, which is the enormous contrast uh, between what I was led to believe as a student, what I think a large part of our profession believes as a whole, despite practicing in a reality that on a <laughs> daily basis actually proves the opposite. Uh, that is essentially, if you ask about uh, an inherent red threat uh, for the book, that, that is exactly that. I mean, all the articles, whether or not it's about past heroes doing utterly bureaucratic things, or whether it's the diary part uh, in the middle, which you know is a string of tragic, somewhat funny uh, kind of things that happen uh, to you, even uh, when you work for a practice that is quite well known, and, and the, banality of the, the banality of the everyday reality vis-a-vis -vis the high-flying um, rhetoric that, that pervades in our circles, that's, that's what the book is about. And it happily explores 
that space. And, and I was at the east coast of America uh, last Saturday, which is, of course, the tem I mean, the temple of, of kind of stuck up, deeply sad, sour, and I have a quote bitter about this uh, <laughs> pretentiousness. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and they're on every level. I mean, on every level, it is so like wonderful Peggy to Dima, find. You mean? Uh, well, whoever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know where the East Coast ends. Uh, <laughs> um, You've got me lost oh, now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, well, no, but it, it's so nice. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's so nice, in a way, to, to discover a pile of evidence, even after having written uh, <laughs> the book. So it was a kind of the, yeah. the, the whole event was a retroactive manifesto for my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the what you point your finger at. Yet I'm also in the middle of this, and I mm -hmm. don't see an alternative, an attempt to theorize and so on. And I can't just all debunk it. And it's a kind of strange thing. But you, you, the, this article, uh, which is the, the third essay, is, is homing in precisely on that questionable scene of an intellectualizing essay. architectural discourse, uh, which, which I'm within and despise. So this is, let me finish. Wow. This is actually the article um, which re recounts a debate which we were on together, yeah. actually, at the, at the first. Chicago uh, Architectural Biennale, and um, I was involved in... I'm very happy that you skip essay two. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> well, I can't go <laughs> all the way through. There's 44 uh, essays, uh, by uh, the way. Okay. Um, and I haven't gone through all of them, by the way. Um, so there was Peter Eisenman, Jeff Kipnis, the two of us, and Theo Thropoulos, uh, my partner at the AADRL. And, um, yeah, you've been very critical, and I want to read what you made from this, about this. And you're saying, as the evening progresses, the event turns into an unpleasant x-ray exposing the current state of American academia, a strangely insular world that is governed by its own autonomous codes, is dominated by antiquated pecking orders, and estranged value systems, and has little hope of finding corrections from within. Which page are you? The often grandiose tone of the discussions contrasts starkly with the marginal importance of what is being dis debated. The Western architectural ivory tower has become a theater of the absurd, self-obsessed, blind to its own decline, and largely oblivious to the real forces that determine the general state of the built environment. So, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty devastating. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, initially, <laughs> It actually, Marcus Frank of Dezine uh, told me to write that. Uh, because we submitted the piece to Dezine, because I think then it would have the widest readership, so the insult will flourish most generally. Uh, uh, but then the, the, the first version we put in didn't qualify as an opinion piece, because uh, it was also the insults were implicit. So they, they told us to tone it up, uh, I, I remember very clearly. So I think this paragraph, the, the, the sort of violent language was enhanced as a result of that. But having said that, uh, I, I also think it. But in the next essay, this continues. And I want to come to a challenge. I'm working up to a challenge. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Take your time. Um, so uh, you, in the next essay, which is actually the, the titled Four Walls and the Roof, uh, the thematic article, um, you suggest that our discourse might be utterly useless, all architectural discourse. And, and you're saying, why do we contemporary architects wallow so deeply in the grand visions we offer? Where does it come from, this God complex? Um, despite a century of architectural mission statements, earnest treatises, and urgent manifestos, the world seems disenchanted. I have yet to meet a client, a public official or any user who is truly interested in the grand promises we make, the lofty motivations we offer for our decisions, mm. or indeed much of what we say at all. Let's face it, architects speak to architects, and as far as the rest of the world is concerned, they can remain forever silent. They should simply get on with their job of designing buildings which, if they are any good, should speak for themselves. So... You're doing great promotion, by the way. 
Are you serious about remaining silent? Well, clearly, <laughs> writing 138,000 <laughs> words, uh, sitting here in, in a book, I'm, I'm not. But this is, you know, the wonderful thing about writing, and particularly the wonderful thing of writing, not necessarily for architectural magazines or things, is that, that they're reflections of moods. And moods swing. And in that sense, I'm no different from anybody else. The moods swing from a kind of euphoric uh, megalomania to utter despair. Uh, and, and in a way, they strangely reveal... I mean, I could have written the book under a pseudonym, uh, like Humbert Humbert. Uh, uh, maybe, but in, in that sense, that's, that's what it does. So that's what I thought at the time I wrote that. And then I enjoyed writing that so much that just more kept coming, uh, where in the end I ended up you know, disproving uh, the, the ideological position I took in that particular essay. So sorry. But you know, <laughs> but there is something else in this article. Uh, on the next page, you are actually seriously talking about our collective responsibility. Yeah. And that means collective responsibility of the discipline. So my question then is, what is our collective responsibility as discipline? And how can we take this up without discourse, architects talking to each other, and without treatises and manifestos? Um, probably not. <laughs> uh, but I also think, I mean, the kind of thing is that I, I, I don't think it's, I, I, I think, yes, I wrote that. And sorry for writing it, but it sounded good, which is a lot of the, uh, which is a lot of the underlying rationale for a lot of paragraphs in the book. But having said that, of course, I don't take position against discourse. Uh, of course, I don't take position against talking or writing. I mean, I do a lot of it happily myself, and I wouldn't be uh, where I was if writing, if talking and writing, wasn't fairly important in our discipline. But I do object to the artificial hermetic limitations of the discourse, of the self-imposed restrictions of the discourse, where we somehow seem to have a discourse that only zooms in and never zooms out. I would find it, and maybe in that sense you're, you're right. I mean, the book doesn't offer an answer, but the book is a very long cry for an answer, and the book is a very long cry for an ideology, hopefully mm. written by somebody who's not a lousy theorist, somebody <laughs> who's a lot more intelligent uh, than I am, where uh, somehow the broader aspects of society, somehow our, uh, our tendency to look uh, uh, through, a, what is it, uh, a footnote under a microscope hoping it will turn into a novel, where somehow that tendency will be broken, where somehow an awareness of our own insignificance might be the introduction to an enhanced significance in a sort of alcohol anonymous kind of <laughs> method. Well, you know, I know what you're talking about when we, when we look at some of these discourses and they seem to become incestuous, they seem to become pretentious. And then at the same time, we need to have ambitions and pretensions. Yeah. And we also, I believe, we need to develop a, some kind of a theoretically informed insider discourse because you can't you need to build up a, a degree of sophistication, of a shared vocabulary, and that's not something which is immediately available to ep those who are just sharing a general public. So, and I want to, I discovered, and it's you toying with a particular ideology and a particular theoretical project, which I feel is where you maybe locate yourself, and you also agree emotionally you locate yourself there, but. But, and and uh, let me just offer that to you. And I think the article in which this is coming out is, and I think that's somehow the positive manifesto on the book, is, the, is essay number nine, uh, The Inevitable Box. And what you're doing there, as far as I'm conceived, is uh, I think it goes back to rational, radical functionalism of the ABC group of Hannes Meyer, Mart Stamm, Hans Schmidt, Elisitsky, this entails, this, this, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, I'm quite familiar with this, and, and I was subscribing to this also at a certain stage in my, in my uh, kind of upbringing as an architect. This entails a rejection of a lot of what we associate with architecture, and part of that uh, kind of idea of composition, and you have a slogan, by the way, uh, against composition. And indeed, for them, 
for those radical functionalists, it entailed the very rejection of the phrase architecture and modern architecture. Le Corbusier is la moderne, and they substituted the phrase Neues Bauen, new building. Mm -hmm. And that was a kind of program in itself. So when you use the slogan, calculation, not composition, and that somehow kind of Hannes Meyer very, very much. And you reject the pursuit of beauty, and you call beauty a retroactive concept, and saying something which I think also comes right out of the discourse, we must declare the results of a rational system. Beautiful in hindsight. Yeah, we just yes. declare yeah. that's the beauty, but it's a rationally calculated result, and that. So can you defend this? And am I right that this is your manifesto? Um, again, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, <laughs> you are aware, uh, I mean, I'm sure you are aware of the extent of irony, particularly in that uh, essay. Uh, some boxes are beautiful, many are ugly. Beauty is not something the world can afford to wait for. We must accept the outcomes of our systems and declare whatever occurs as a result beautiful. Beauty uh, can only exist as a retroactive uh, concept, a form of surrender to the inevitable. Like good sportsmanship, beauty is in the graceful admission of defeat. Uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, uh, this is um, an essay more and more about actually the general overtones over our profession. This is an essay because I think the ideological stance that you're implying I take I think is more embodied in the essays immediately prior where I fetishize uh, you know a monster like Atlanta Airport okay. where yeah. I idealize Neufert as, as, uh, as a hero. It's and, in the same and vein. Yes it is. It's also in the same part so clearly it's in the same vain, but it's the last essay and it, mm. it talks of certain habits dying hard and of certain habits and automatisms in architecture present and also the, the need to answer on multiple fronts, financial front, uh, da, 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 that to some extent uh, the more you're involved in answering for your decisions, the more actually the concept of free will and emerges and a sort of inescapability. The, I think the most beautiful line or the most beautiful thing in that essay is that I, I say something that the box is the outcome of the most subliminal process and the box is the outcome of no process at all. The most, at the same time, the most architectural and also the outcome of you know, the situation where there is no architect uh, involved and they're eerily close. I think on this uh, uh, loop that is meanwhile distracting everybody. Uh, there is a church of Mies yeah. on the IIT campus yeah. and immediately after it there is a car repair workshop that we accidentally discovered in Rotterdam <laughs> and they're so <laughs> eerily similar and uh, you know that is again uh, it's a long rant it's a long rant about, an, uh, about something that is essentially unresolved in my head, too. I mean, for me, uh, what, what attracted me to this is the radical exorcism of the concept of art, mm -hmm. which comes in that, and to, to deny that. And I mean, Hannes Meyer too famously said, all things in this world are the product of the formula function times economy. Mm -hmm. And so this is the, the radical Pragmatism. And I think um, the next article, you're investing in this and you're pushing this because we, talk, we talk, talked about it earlier as well, where you make a very, very detailed and impressive research into the industrialized, industrialized building program of the GDR, the Socialist Communist GDR. And, and, and uh, that's the article called Ar Architektur ohne Eigenschaften, which means architecture without characteristics. And then I think there's also the investment in the work of Ernst Neufert. So there's some kind of, and the, the book cover is in a way, home is in the same uh, way. There's this kind of strange uh, endorsement of, maybe is it an ethos of pragmatism, which tries to wipe out all other pretenses. And my question then is, this episode in particular, that GDR work. Does this episode hold out the promise of a viable model? 
for us? Um, I think it's a process that served its purpose uh, at the time extremely well. Uh, East Germany uh, was confronted with, a fun after World War II, with a phenomenal housing crisis, an almost unsolvable thing. And initially they were uh, entrapped in this kind of Stalinist, highly decorated architecture, palaces for the people that took way too long to build to actually address the housing issue. Before the GDR fell in, uh, at the end of the 80s, numerically they nearly had, which is an amazing uh, achievement, which was an achievement nobody thought uh, could happen. So it did serve its purpose very well. And I think that of communism as a whole, it's a vilified system, but there's never been a system that uh, so quickly removed so many people from poverty. Uh, and, and that I find uh, impressive. I also find it impressive how he's, and, and then- I think the capitalism did quite a bit more on this. Well. I, I'm not so sure, uh, but I mean, that's maybe subject to, to a longer uh, discussion. But what I found interesting, but, and that's where the affinity yeah. comes from, is that um, in researching it, actually the same factories, the same companies supplied uh, the prefabricated panels to East Germany as actually the company that had supplied the prefabricated panels to housing projects in the Netherlands. As a matter of fact, one of the housing projects in the Netherlands that I grew up in, uh, which was a similar a kind of characterless, beautifully characterless uh, environment with large uh, grass fields where the Dutch soccer was very good at the time of that, uh, uh, of, of, of that period, and how we imagine that that is over, and, and I wonder, is it over? Well, my view and this is house, actually by the way, I'm, I so have a lot of sympathy no. for these articles, this period, and the spirit we're trying to demystify and let pragmatism rule. Mm. But for me, that doesn't mean that composition is out because I see, I'm instrumentalizing everything as well, but I think compositional uh, pursuits are uh, functional, functional in terms of making relationships and organizations legible. Mm. And it doesn't been, and there's an intuitive capacity, and we also navigate intuitively. So that's where I would come in. But the, the, so the theoretical um, um, underpinnings in principles, I would, I would, call, I would, I would tie in with. But the um, the way this was panned out, there was a reductionism in what, yeah. how performance was defined. It, it was lacking visual performance, for instance. Yeah, well, that's that's. Some, I have a somewhat peculiar taste in architecture, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, people tell me that. So I'm not 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 sure. I, I entirely adore. So what I think is is another thing is that, uh, and and I will, yep. since the book is out uh, essentially today, and nobody knows what we're talking about because uh, nobody's had the chance to read. I will elaborate a little bit. Um, in the East German effort, a lot of German architects who had. Uh, essentially worked in the Soviet Union, either as prisoners of war or, as, or had even emigrated to the Soviet Union in, 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 in fleeing uh, Nazism, came back to Germany to do the rebuilding effort. So there's a lot of people had a Bauhaus uh, effort. And one of the things is I quote uh, Mies, and he says, when the industry takes over and the other, the other problem, the, all our problems uh, would be naturally solved. And that you then see that as the once you take that to an extreme conclusion, that the role of the architect, as we knew it until then, completely disappears. He, in a way, disappears. Modern architecture disappears because it dissolves uh, in the industry. And when the Bauhaus actually, in East Germany, they got what they propagated. They got what they asked for. And in that sense, you know, that essentially a Bauhaus experiment can take place on the scale of a country, on the scale of a society. Yeah. It's an x-ray into the penultimate outcome of that of, I, of that ideology and ideology as a whole. And for me, it's, it's quite interesting. This house on the cover is a house in, uh, in, in, in a little village in Germany called Wusterwirtz, where all the names of the streets are uh, Karl Marxstraße, Friedrich Engelstraße, August Bebelstraße, etc., etc., all of the communist heroes. And it's got houses like this, a sort of uh, Hans and Gretel uh, 
Häuser. Uh, and, and, and the kind of thing is that this particular house, and a lot of these houses, they're made of recycled panels of the old uh, East German housing estate. So the hardcore, the exact same technology that generates these alienate, supposedly alienating hardcore massive housing estates then leads to kind of Hans and Gretel. Uh, and if you photograph, I think I have a lecture where I, I, I do a sepia filter uh, over the thing, and it looks like 1900, which is a very interesting outcome of the 20th century in many ways that sort of, well, it, it, my, it didn't my, happen. My view is I'm 100% with you when, when you point out how many people were lifted out of poverty and you can debate which systems contribute to this, that this matters and that we, I'm happy also to, that discourses in the end feed into an instrumentalized rollout and become part of a big, big prosperity process and engine. And that's where in the end the rubber hits the road and where we, where, what becomes the, the success criteria of innovations. Mm -hmm. But if we look at this building on the front cover here, we, yes, costs are minimal. Uh, I would say there is not, not, there's a cost set and the benefit side, and I would say if you had the Rietfeld house, uh, there were certain innovations in terms of flexibility, openness, porosity, interactions, family structure, etc., uh, and that could have been rolled out in a Plattenbau fashion. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, forget this. But I also want to say that when you talk about the inevitability of the box, I think this is the inevitability of the box was a 1960s inevitability. Mm -hmm. And it was a 1960s, like, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, mm -hmm. uh, huge success, material prosperity to millions and millions of people. Uh, but we've moved on, so I want to look at this historically, and my argument is that we're living in a different era, yeah. uh, not the era of mass mechanical reproduction and nine to five and rolling out across the suburbs. We have a different condition now, and that leads me to another uh, point. Uh, but can I respond yeah, to this yeah. one? Uh, because uh, I, I know that's what you think, and, and you're probably uh, also partly, or, or, or you're probably also all right, but old de 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 ha habits uh, die hard. And if I look around me, I think the box is <laughs> pretty alive. Tragically. No? It, it's Tra tragically alive. <laughs> and, tragically and, you know, alive. life is what happens while we are planning all sorts of other things. And if I look at data centers, if I look at the most modern sure. of architecture well, being architecture. across the... D well, it's debatable. <laughs> uh, but... M um, and I'll tell you, you know, why, and, using and your own quote. Mm -hmm. Can I quote something? My favorite quote in the whole book is, life is unquestionably more interesting than architecture. Have I said that? <laughs> <laughs> and I 100% subscribe to this. And then he said something else I also subscribe to, and only becomes more so as society grows more, more complex. complex. Yes. So my question. I think that is that is, re that is about the park with the, the with the, the sex encounters, no? And this is a, this uh, is in the uh, end. Uh, <laughs> you managed to you sort of managed to isolate the least interesting sentence of that chapter, but. Uh. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a great sentence. That means we are not fetishizing the box as an aesthetic. Well. It has to work. It has to be put to work, and I think it's no longer working because we're living in a level of complexity, mm. and the life process. So my question is: Does complexity interest you? And how can architect architecture cope with the new level of societal complexity? And I challenge Rem with this too, because he was yeah, also yeah, kind yeah. of puzzled. But he's, but he's not here. About complexity. Um, <laughs> I think, um, I'm not sure to what extent the complexity of life ought to lead to complex architecture. Uh, I, I think there, and there I have a fundamentally humble notion uh, about the notion of architecture, I actually think that the more complex society grows, the harder it is to reflect in architecture, and that therefore architecture should take a model role in hosting the complexity uh, rather than reflecting uh, the complexity and be a minimal obstacle in the unfolding of the complexity rather than competing with the complexity. <laughs> Sounds plausible, mm. but and I have. I just made it up. <laughs> no, no, no. You ask for a I've position. Heard, so I've heard. Uh, I've heard this a lot, but but I don't buy this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, no, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's apparent. Uh, um, <laughs> and there have been a number of uh, innovations, I think, in terms of activating all the angles and, and the use of curvature to maintain legibility in the face of complexity. Because if you proliferate boxes and boxes and boxes yeah. and let them intersect and, and proliferate, you get a kind of a loss in the kaleidoscope of, of rectilinear um, splinters. And that becomes illegible in my view. But mm. uh, we're but nearly I mean, uh, through yeah. my, uh, making, uh, my, my, my sort of challenges, and maybe we can open up soon. But um, there is something very interesting. This article I put the quote for is actually about public space. Mm -hmm. And um, you define public space as the space accessible to all, subject only to common law. And this implies, you say, public space is a product of law and not of architecture and urban planning. You also say the obligation to fulfill specific purposes throws public space into an existential crisis. So mm. can you explain that? It's the same as what I just said. Uh, uh, but then apply to public space and not onto the box, that it's, uh, it's, it's about the hosting uh, of things. And I think if you look at the new urbanists who, in a way, have tried to craft life by the nature of public space, which actually, ironically, is the type of public space that occurs most in privatized developments. Uh, but if you look at the Andreas Duaney and, and, and all those kind of things, that they are almost debilitatingly offensive in not capturing the true uh, uh, complexity of life. I mean, the, the start of that thing is about a, uh, a park where uh, a public park with all kinds of official ambitions, et cetera, and people mainly go there to have sex. And then the municipal, and, 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 and by the way, the main character is, is, a, is a woman in search of heterosexual sex, which is somewhat different than what we imaginally imagine these parks to be. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then the municipality actually unleashes a particular species of buffaloes uh, in the hope <laughs> of discouraging people to have sex <laughs> in that park. But that has a, a sort of awkward side effect in the sense that then they get chased away, but sexual activities just <laughs> proliferate in, in the park, and the animals start to have sex, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, in a way, a testimony to, you know, who, which new urbanist would craft and design a scenario like that? All you need is bushes. Uh, and, and all you need is, you know, as many obstacles to social control, uh, uh, no cameras, that's all you need for that to unfold. And I thought that was kind of quite nice. And it's, it's a but humbling, it's, it's in a way a humbling observation that it might be better to do that well rather than capturing and predicting all the complexity. I mean, that's pretty much, of course, also the, the, the theoretical foundation of a lot of our own architectural work in our, if you want to go there. I want to because I think that's where you... Um, but it's my own book, so it's, it's got nothing to do with OMA. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, before we get the audience in, but this is maybe the myth you're promoting still, the, the, the last myth you haven't debunked yet, the myth of this kind of public space which, in, which, which you kind of romanticize as a kind of all inclusive, all democratic, all open. And uh, then the, the question is, who is delivering that space? And I think it's not one space, it's many, many spaces. Mm. And I s outed myself as saying we should uh, expect it never from the state. Because the state will give that f bland, super safe, uh, stereotype, mean voters kind of um, um, uh, public space, which is always the same shrubs and, 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 and um, benches and rules mm -hmm. of policing. So yeah, I, I think it's public space has nothing to do with the public in the sense of no, democratic, no, 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 no. And I, in my view anyway. No, but that's also not what I'm saying, I think. <laughs> Uh -huh. And it's also not then in as much as I'm saying it's not what I'm thinking. I mean, public space is what we call public space. That doesn't mean it's, it's provided better by the state than pri by the private sector or vice versa. The argument of that essay is that 
public space emerges as the accidental byproduct of actually trying to do something else. And I think that in general, some of the most valuable, uh, precious things in general often emerge as the accidental byproduct of other efforts. And, and I, I think that's also the thesis uh, of the book. Uh, and it's ne not never an, uh, uh, a promotion or a propaganda to stop doing what we're doing in many ways. But it's just about an awareness that probably what matters most emerges in the most accidental fashion. I'm opening it up. Shall we? <laughs> Uh, in the front, right here. No, we are, we, <laughs> are we are mic'd, sorry. We are mic'd, we are mic'd, but... A uh, uh, what? A roaming mic. Roaming mic. Um, <coughs> could you elaborate on the way in which OMA practices architecture compared to, say, other architects in the Netherlands, such as Herman Herzberger, for instance? No. <laughs> uh, I've never worked for Herman Herzberger. I've only had him uh, as a very delightful uh, teacher. Um, I could, uh, there's one major difference. Uh, because, I mean, I, 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 I think I know the way he works in his office, which is fairly represented from a lot of objects in the sense that uh, there is an office, first of all, named after a man. Our office is not named after a man. That man is a lot more well-known uh, than Hermann Herzberger is. In a sense. But maybe he is that, actually partially, because he had the wisdom of not naming his office after himself. Um, Hermann Herzberger produces sketches. I think uh, what I've seen, it's 6B to 8B is the pencil with which they were made. It was a different mm. age. Um, I remember that. Uh, and, 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 and the softness of the pencil is proportional to the vagueness of the instructions, but instructions they are nonetheless. So it's interesting that the degree of authority is embedded in the vagueness uh, 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 of the pencil, but essentially, and then the office works it out. And it's, <laughs> and in that sense, the way our office works is that it starts with a con often many projects start with a conversation. They start with a hunch. They're, they're, that hunch is also vague, but everybody knows it's vague. Even whoever puts forward the hunch is uh, quite overt about the fact that it's vague. But our office works not on the basis of an instruction, but on the basis of strategic provocations to the many who work in the office, to then harvest, uh, in a, a, to, to, to collect the harvest that results from the provocation and kind of take it from there. So the initiative and, and the ambiguity of where the initiative lies is a crucial factor in our office. And I don't, I mean, I have not, and, I've, and again, I've only had the man as a teacher. I have not discovered that uh, with him. Anybody else? Here. Oh, yeah. um, uh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hi. Um, I'd like to ask about um, originality as a theme. And because I'm kind of, it seems there's the kind of rivaling um, sort of ideologies of, you know, there's no need for ego or originality, and ideas will be enough to explain themselves, and buildings enough to explain the ideas. Whereas, um, so I was just, there's a conflicting approaches to it. So I'd, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And the apparent need from the current, you know, when a client asks if it's a large project, that, you know, we want something different and original, and the idea with the person with the pen or the pencil versus ideas, anonymous ideas. Sorry. Uh. I got the question. OK, well, you go <laughs> first, ask. then. I go first, though. Well, uh, certainly originality is a value in with respect to the fact that the discipline needs to evolve as history evolves. So particular societal changes, like transformations accelerate. 
to this one has to ca catch up. And for that, it had evolved a kind of special, uh, let's say, department within the overall discourse and discipline, which is, I call it, or has been called the avant-garde. And in the avant-garde, originality it trumps everything else, because the whole point is to find new things. And you're quite forgiving with respect. And of course, then it's also good if these new things do something positive. And they give us a potential, at least, of a, of a better performance downstream. But the first criterion of being part of it is originality. But of course, in the mainstream and in the rollout, in the final analysis, originality, just novelty, means very little. It, it is innovation, higher performance, and the value when you're in a paradigm and you have a degree of stability, it is, of course, top high performance delivery, which counts. But in each new decade, there must have been an innovation worked through within the avant-garde and elaborated and pushed until you reach that level of, of, of um, performance. So in the, in the discipline as a whole, um, it it's doesn't count finally to the, for the client, it shouldn't count. He, he shouldn't care less. He should, he, what he should care about is that he gets a top performance. But the discipline in its research branch needs to worry and, and, and endorse originality. So it, I would, I, you can't take the stance of, I would say, Renier to, to, to find it always already suspicious. No, but I, I, don't, I, don't I have kind of methodical tolerance with respect to people who just want to be original. No, but I have a mild tolerance yeah. of originality <laughs> too. I mean, don't get me wrong. But it's, it's uh, because I thought you were asking this in response to a particular essay, but I realized that the book is only out today, so that, that is impossible. But so I will reply by, there are many ideas, there are a few good ideas. Good ideas occur infrequently. Technology, the media, and the internet do nothing to change that. Sometimes centuries pass before the next good idea presents itself. Entire generations are forgotten by history because they didn't have a good idea. Um, so it's, it's, it's about rhythm. Uh, and and I, I, I do think that the market economy and the whole element of competition, which is such a prime driver and also such a prime driver in the consciousness of architects, provokes a rhythm of inventions that is simply humanly impossible. So therefore, I think that the media and the, 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 that you get a lot of pseudo invention presented under the uh, name uh, uh, of originality that aren't really invention. So in that sense, I, I, I propose a slightly more relaxed uh, attitude to originality in order to kind of be able to discover it, because I think originality is creating its own smokescreen uh, at the moment. And um, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I love yeah. Mises' quote, you can't invent a new architecture every Monday morning. Yeah. And for me, innovation has very little to do with fashion cycles and fashions. And, and that's, for me, the facile. And I think Rem is actually, and Orme is, is guilty of this to some extent. And yes, therefore uh, includes uh, Rainier. Yeah. That is kind of the, the, <laughs> the idea of being novel also through retro. So uh, through, through kind of going, when everybody else is moving somewhere, you go, you go somewhere else. And even if that's a retro. But it's uh, a very effective trick, though. <laughs> you must and admit. And therefore, you are quite <laughs> in that space of wanting to be always against the grain fashion with other and so on. Mm. And it's the same thing, I think, the, the going into the countryside, because everybody has finally understood the message of urbanity and, and urbanization and, 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 and let's say, uh, the culture of congestion. At that very moment, you, mm. you, know, you guys go into the countryside. Yeah. It's, it's very so facile. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't generalize. I'm, 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 I'm in the middle of the city right here. Um, there's a very interesting thing, uh, and, and it's, it's a recent experience we have in the office, that we brainstorm, we design, and, and then... And you, you got something, you're onto something, and, and you think, ha, haven't seen that yet. And then somebody starts Googling, doing image. Uh, and all of a sudden, I mean, who are all these copycats? <laughs> uh, but they actually, and then you check the date, and, 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 and but then it seems they had the, uh, so I think we have so much originality that actually the copy precedes the original in an, <laughs> in, 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 in an ultimate uh, confusion of time. So I, I think that Einstein uh, mm -hmm. has entered the realm of, <laughs> of originality in a strange way. Yeah.
and uh, and um, having Leith through the book congratulate you on something very clearly written and readable and particularly uh, a piece in here that says Van Eyck habitually lost himself in rage nobody understood Rossi's English and Eisenman's openly professed dilemmas were and are impenetrable as his building designs <laughs> um, now I, I, I remember actually one, one of the most confusing evenings I think I've ever spent was when the man after whom your firm is not named um, <laughs> was in conversation with Alejandro Zero Polo uh, discussing his uh, re receiving of the RABA, RABA gold medal. Is it a disadvantage to be understood? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, uh, time will tell. Uh, that is, I, I never thought about it in those terms. Uh, but I prefer understanding uh, to not understanding. And I, I, I clearly I remember my development as an architect. And, and it used to be the case that when I didn't understand something, I thought, that must be highly intelligent. <laughs> and I don't know whether that's kind of an, o whether that's modesty or actually uh, a form of hubris. But I, anyway, I thought it. But I don't think that anymore. I don't think that anymore. And I think regardless of advantage or disadvantage, I think it's better to understand and it's better to be understood. If only, and, and that to some extent also a system of checks and balances about architecture should be based on understanding. You know, and I, I don't particularly like newspeak. I mean, I think as a writing style, it's... But there is something else. Um, I'm somebody who is always trying to understand and drill until I understand. But I also recognize one thing, that intuition is something very potent. And we are supercomputers up here, which make associations, connections, and see things, and, 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 and calculate things in inverted commas, which we can't at that very moment make explicit again. And that's, for instance, the genius of Zaha Hadid, for instance. Uh, what she's seeing and what she's offering and what, she, what she's delivering and, and, and without uh, making it explicit in terms of a rational discourse. And, but then one can still, the task is to rationalize, make explicit, rational reconstruct. But I believe in intuition and also trust my own sometimes and often. Uh, but then also critically investigate whether these intuitions are they need to be probed too, so that it shouldn't become fetishes. And it is problematic, of course, that uh, the way people like Rossi and Eisenman. Eisenman is somebody who's actually tried to give analytic rigor to what he's doing, but a lot of these characters, uh, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt and try to understand what they've been pushing. A lot of people felt that there was something and something um, profound coming. And it's, 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 it's a bit risky to just dismiss it. And that goes to you, Peter, also. <laughs> Clarity, I mean, this was the whole thing of post-structuralist uh, wave. They also said the kind of, the clear and distinct ideas, which when the British philosophy always insisted so much and was so proud of, if, if it becomes too much of a stricture, it gets in the way of discovering a lot of things. There's something, another quote, by the way, on page, uh, I don't know where it is. Anyway, uh, it's, it says, no, nothing is ever wholly obvious without becoming enigmatic. And I think <laughs> that is, that's both yeah. of the are. Yeah. I think that's yeah. extremely uh, apt. Yeah. Sorry. So, so there, but there is the difference between ideas which perhaps need to be understood, need effort to understand, and need yeah. uh, uh, explanation as well, and emperor's new clothes. Sure, there's a lot of that too. But it can't be the, uh, I think we should have a more tolerant working hypothesis because otherwise we, we, we don't discover a lot of the pearls and all the shit. <laughs> that is very well put. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and remarkably clear. Yeah. <laughs> and penetrable. <laughs> and smelly. It's the French versus, versus English. Yeah. Shumi? Hey, sorry, I'm going to be a little bit indulgent and do what I hate and then take a moment to say, congratulations, Renia, you got the book out. <laughs> I know it was, uh, you know, it's a, it's a courageous thing to do, especially, as you say, you, you have a, a, a critique somewhere in there about 
vocalizing our thoughts so much, but then you have done so candidly. Anyway, that's not the question that I wanted to ask you. Um, when you were starting to make this book, what was interesting to, I think, both of us in, in discussions was that it, it's not a book about architects talking to architects. Indeed, it's published by an economics department. And harking back to something that you said earlier today, tonight about zooming out and remembering some of the conversations that we had about, well, what, what are economists going to make about these kind of quite internal architectural discussions? Do you think you could talk a little bit about that, about framing these discussions for a different field? Um, again, uh, you know, uh, it was one of the ideas. That I hope it will happen. Uh, and and it, it remains to be seen uh, if it will. Uh, I mean, an, e an economics department showed an interest in my writing because I showed an interest in a book produced by that economics uh, department. So it was an, an, an effort, in a way, the, the book of Thomas Piketty. Uh, it, 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 it was an effort at, at in a way, crossing uh, the boundaries of the, of, of the thing. I think... Uh, with the exception of one, uh, for instance, of the endorsers on the back of the book, everybody's from the world of architecture. I'm also quite curious to know how many people tonight uh, will be of the world of architecture. And it proves a hard... Uh, there's a, a review coming out in The Economist, which, I'm very, which I hope will be positive, but uh, even if not, there's a review coming out uh, in the magazine The Economist, which means that there are slight... Um, uh, and, and, and there was a, a blurb of, of, of Farufakis, which didn't material, blah, blah, blah. The, but there are slight breaches uh, of, of the hermetic bastion of architecture. Whether it will or not, I don't know. Uh, I mean, and, and, and the expectation is that once it settles in the world of architecture, that it might make its way beyond, but we basically don't know. It's written with that intention uh, in, in, in mind, and therefore it also uses the language uh, that it uses. I mean, so let's hope so. Maybe I just want to add a reflection to that. My, the zooming out is very important. Um, but I don't expect ever my writings to be read, read by anybody but architects. But the zooming out is bringing in the discourses particular the theory of society and societal development and socioeconomic processes into our reflections to guide us what we give back our buildings. But to do that on a very sophisticated level we have to work through a lot of information that zooming out and, and bring it down and bring it in and, and discuss it through and then we output buildings and the books we write are for ourselves to do these better. That's my way of breaking that frame. And yeah. One more question? Or? or shall we have a drink? <laughs> <laughs> one more, come on. There's one. Last question over there. Uh, the, the, what you talk about between um, uh, the, the rational and the irrational, it goes back to Plato and Aristotle. And I wonder, it's quite interesting to think about rational architecture, which tends to be often um, not necessary, which, which is anti-authoritarian in a way because it has its own rationality. It's often adopted by dictators and uh, such like, whereas... Um, Irrational architecture, say Zazad Adid's architecture, needs you to have faith in the way of, um, well, perhaps it's not irrational, but basically it's, it's emotional in a way, and um, it leads you to have faith in the wizard, as it were, rather than uh, any other sort of argument based on logic. I, do you want, shall I answer? Or, or <laughs> <laughs> the pros and cons and motivations and performance advantages of the kind of work we're doing and the kind of solutions we propose. There's an enormous amount of rationality. It doesn't mean that. Yeah. And the inception of this kind of universe of exploration 
could have been a rational deduction, but but it is a highly rational work, um, and uh, that's for another lecture. <laughs> but I think anyway, there's plenty of evidence of, and I would never call, you know, I would never distinguish. Uh, between the box and, and let's say more flamboyant types of architecture as rational or irrational. I mean, I don't emphatically don't make that equation. There's a question of architectural style, and I think there probably isn't an architectural style that has happily straddled the divide between the dictatorial and the democratic. Uh, Corbusier, uh, you know, happily worked for the Fichy uh, regime. I mean, there we could give plenty of examples. Uh, uh, you know, of dictators use, using either and uh, either the modern, the classical, etc., etc., etc. I mean, if you write a history book, that that I think will forever dispel the myth that a particular style belongs to a particular political disposition. By now, on that note, thanks everybody. <laughs> That's very nice.